thanks for doing this. Are you on? It's okay.
Um, we are grateful to worship a God who will seek after us in love and by the Spirit. So we hope that you are able to encounter Christ's love and Christ's freedom this morning as you worship and contemplate the Lord's glory. In 2 Colossians 3, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That we all, with unveiled faces, the unveiled meaning that others can look upon our faces we encounter God and we experience, experience the Lord unlike Moses was able to do. When he experienced God and the Israelites couldn't look upon his face. So we, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord.
to the writer of the next song. When we understand that our God is unstoppable, our praise becomes unstoppable as well. Scripture is filled with awe-inspiring examples of God's strength and stories of God's unending glory, from moving mountains to rolling stones away from a borrowed tomb. There is something our God can't do. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. All power on earth and in heaven has been given to Jesus. God promises he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. There will be no mourning, crying, or pain anymore. For the former things have passed away.
ourselves to you. We cannot thank you enough for that. And Lord, right now we just ask that you'll be with the children as they're heading off to Kid Zone. We ask that you will be with us as we focus on drawing near to you. Thank you for the opportunity we have to worship you. May all we do today honor you as we, your children, love you. Thank you for loving us. In your name, amen. And the kids are dismissed to Kid Zone. And you can be seated. So our scripture today is from Colossians 4, 2 through 6. And we're going to give you uh, a time to reflect on the verses after we, after we read each piece of scripture. It's right in Colossians 4, verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer. So what are you looking for in your prayers? How important is it that you're spending time with God? How is praying part of your daily life? Being watchful and thankful. Pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Who are those people you are asking our Lord to give you an opportunity so you might share His love and message with them? How often is this part of your conversation with them? as it is with the law. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. In talking with others, what do you most want that other person to experience? Apostle Peter challenges us this way. 
but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. And always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and with respect. Do you find yourself being prepared to share the hope that is within you? Does that cause you excitement or does that create you fear?
may you anoint our minds and hearts. I think we, we automatically say, kind of know this, we got it down. But I think there are some things, Lord, that you always want to reveal to us about yourself. And this morning, may we be attentive to that. We pray in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, how many of you actually grew up in a family that said, like, prayers before meals? Anybody can get to that, the pattern of your prayers? Okay, a, a lot of you have. Um, it's something that uh, some people um, have. It's very much a ritual. It's kind of a, a thing that, that is really important for a lot of families. We also had this tradition as we grew up. It was a really important one. Uh, my dad would pray first. And it would be typically the same prayer, but just, you know, praying the blessing of the food that might anoint us, give us strength. Um, and then we kids had to say a prayer. And uh, it was, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for this food, amen. Anybody else say that prayer? Anybody else? Okay, I, a few others. See, it's kind of, must have been just a, a, a thing that all the, uh, all the kids would have to say. Well, one, one time, my Uncle Rich was up and he was there with the family that often come up, we'd go out to Big Lake and um, we would we'd spend time camping out there and so they would come up during the summer and I remember he pulled me aside one time, he knew about this ritual and he said, you know, I want to teach you a prayer that I think will fit well within the evening grace meal. And so he, he taught it to me and I heard, prepared myself to be able to speak that at the meal and sure enough my dad starts praying and then it goes from my oldest sister, Sandy, to my brother, Jim. I'm third in the line, and then it kind of goes down to the next three kids, with six kids in the family. So it came to my time, and I, I waited a moment, and I said, good food, good meat, good God, let's eat. And all of a sudden, I felt this whack right upside my head. I was close to my dad, and uh, then my uncle started to snicker. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And then he just let it out and laughed, and of course, that pretty much wrecked anything that happened after that in the prayer time. It all went downhill from there. So my dad did let me know that we're not going to be saying that prayer again. So that did not make it to our prayer repertoire as we move forward, but it certainly made an impact on my life. <laughs> Needless to say, we have prayers that we pray, and sometimes we don't really think about it. They're just, they're just prayers we give out. But there are some significant prayers that I think are really important for us to understand. And it must be a pattern in many people. Uh, I looked at the research on that, and the number one practice of religious people that were, no matter um, what religion you are in, is, of course, prayer. But when it comes to people who are followers of Jesus, and that they did some numbers on there, and they've been tracking prayer, in that way since 1993 Barner Research, and the numbers have stayed consistently the same. Which means, four out of five adults, 84% claim that they pray at least once a week. That's pretty good. Of that numbers, the prayers that they have to say, the vast majority, are about asking God to help them or to help someone that they know, a loved one, in a current situation. Um, less than 38% prayed for the prayer that there would be an increased intimacy with God. So I found that to be pretty, you know, one out of three, that's, that's pretty good, one, intimacy. Here's something interesting. 41% say, my prayers are answered often. That's pretty good. Only 1.5% percent in the surveys they've had said that their prayers never get answered. Does that surprise you? It's like, yeah, that's a little, that was surprising to me. And what's interesting, though, is that of that number, 73% said, well, I know why the prayers aren't answered. Um, it's because they didn't fit into God's plan, or really, I just stopped listening. So, I guess that makes a little bit more sense. But can you guess what people's response was to the following question? Here it is. Do the majority of your prayers ask how you might fit better into God's plan? Or do the majority of your prayers ask God how I might best meet your needs? How many think it's the first one? Majority of your prayers ask how you might fit better into God's plan. Nobody. Nobody here thinks that. I guess that's right. I mean, we all kind of know, yeah. 
you know, that's the tough one. That's, that's really the more difficult one to pray than just asking God to intervene in the way to meet my needs or what I would like to see happen. In his book entitled The Trivialization of God, Don McCullough tells the time he went to Scotland to begin a doctorate at Edinburgh University. And he was there a few weeks ahead of his family. And he had to find housing. And uh, he, he said this, this is part of the story, he says, Having some time myself, I attended a concert at Usher Hall. It was a delightful evening, until the performance ended, and I walked out into a very rainy night. I hadn't taken an umbrella. I hadn't even taken a raincoat. Not to worry, I told myself, because I could run back to my room before I got too soaked. So with the confidence bolstered by complete ignorance, I raced off through the dark streets. And the rain began to fall with increased conviction. Everything became more unfamiliar, and fear formed like a ball in my gut, and it continued to rise. Regardless of my efforts to keep it down, into my consciousness, it was gnawing away at my courage until I felt completely um, unsafe, undone. Eventually, as W.C. Fields put it, I had to take the bull by the tail and face the situation. I was outrageously lost. I did not know where I was. I needed help. But even mothers and stray cats had quit the night. I wandered aimlessly, despairingly. Suddenly, there was a man who appeared. What had sent him into such unhospitable circumstances? Do angels speak with a Scottish accent? Whoever he was, I needed him. Sir, please, can you help me find a way to the Edinburgh, you know, residence at Edinburgh? Do you know the way? Hey, you need to go three blocks down the street, then turn on the car for three minutes, then go to the street, then turn right, and then you go this, and you take the next stop, and you're there. Oh, oh. Uh, and the look on his face was one of complete... I have no idea really what you said, and I'm trying to understand. Uh, and, and the guy looked at him, and he saw the confusion, and he realized, you don't know where you're going, do you? And uh, no. Okay. I'll show you. Follow me. And so he reflects on this experience and the moments that followed. And he said, it was at that moment that I think my faith was suddenly at a point where it could grow. It, it wasn't until I realized I was lost that I absolutely needed, needed someone intervene that I could move forward. I dedicated not a fleeting second thought of my watery appearance, my fearful panting, my confused speech, or even the trust of the stranger. At that time, my faith was completely, unremarkably focused on just following this man. That's all it was. I, I have no choice. I don't know where I'm going. I've got to follow him. He knows the way. He says authentic Christian faith is blind in this way. He said, this is the thing. We do not walk by sight. We walk by faith. Trust in what? In the things that we don't know. This is where God's divine revelation come in. I think that's a really key attitude. In fact, a friend of mine, Ivan Belheisen, said the best, best prayer he ever prayed was when he was the most desperate that he ever remembers, and all he cried out to God was, help me, help me. He said, that's my most profound prayer. And God met him right at that point. I mentioned my pursuit of wanting to grow more in love with Jesus, wanting to, to, to make sure I hadn't lost my first love, to make him the highest, most important priority of my life. It, it's been my goal all the way along, but you know, sometimes you just get, you get lost, right? There's so many other things. It's kind of like, yes, you're my priority, but there's, there's all these other 16 other things. I got to look at it. And you're there, and I'm giving you that, but you know, these other things are drawing my attention away. I think I lost myself and tried to please him more out of fear for a while and out of shame than in response to his great love for me. Again, I've been re-energized by reading the book that I mentioned, Miraculous Movement, How Hundreds of Thousands of Muslims Are Falling in Love with Jesus, kind of talking about what's going on in our world. 
And I hope you realize there is much more of a dramatic revival that is taking place as thousands upon thousands of people that you would never expect to come to know Jesus in this way are moving from this enslavement of hopeless legalism to embrace the only means of salvation and what God really wants them to know. The remarkable gift of Jesus' sacrifice can free them in this life to understand God's great love. In fact, I think this is interesting because he goes to talk about how whole mosques um, are actually becoming followers of Christ. And of course, we know that God breaks through these barriers. But on a human level, there's a constant theme that keeps coming up. As he interviewed and as he's been part of this major movement that uh, has taken place, he said there's one key element that has made it all happen, that has brought this about. And he said, I cannot tell you more passionately that it is through abundant prayer. It is through people absolutely committing themselves to God in that helpless place. God, I want you. Prayer is the greatest weapon that any disciple maker can yield. God's people have been entering into this interaction with God. Um, in fact, right now around the world that's taken place. And I thought it was interesting this morning. Um, I get uh, Voice of the Martyrs, um, the magazine and something, but they also send me um, the... The things that are going on, each day I get something to pray for. And it was interesting this morning, um, what came through is, will you please pray for our brothers and sisters in China right now? Because it is intensely difficult in this moment right now. So will you please pray for them? In fact, I'm just going to have us pray together. Lord Jesus, we know that around the world, there are all kinds of people who are suffering persecution. There are people who are willing to take a stand for you. And Lord, it's dangerous. It's life-threatening. And they have asked for our prayers from across the sea, from around the world. And I thank you that we get an opportunity just to lift up right now those specific believers who are in China who are passionate about living for you, no matter what the cost. Now, they're being strategic. They're being wise in what they're trying to do. But at the same time, there comes those critical moments where they have to stand in the gap. And it costs them a lot. So will you strengthen their hearts, give them peace, protect them, watch over them, grant them wisdom? We, your people, who live in relative safety here in the United States, we recognize we don't understand that. But even though we don't understand, you've invited us to pray. And there's something that happens when we lift that up to you. So anoint them, Lord. Give them the strength they need at this time. We pray in your name. Amen. And, and I also think it's fascinating that they came this morning, and, uh, and, and Matt and Emily, um, who are, have been missionaries to China, um, are back here right now waiting to see what God is going to do. But, but I am so grateful for the gift of being able to enter into this place where we just listen, right? God brings things up. God's people kneel in prayer. They ask for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Around the world, we know that there are communities that are being transformed by, by God working through his faithful disciples. A huge spiritual battle is raging. Um, there are people who are tenacious prayer warriors who are on their knees. Men and women have the passion and faith to pray, believing the impossible, the unstoppable God will do just that. Fervent they have, they have known that I I cannot help but live in this reality. And where many people are praying and fasting, uh, engaging in lostness by intentionally applying some of the disciple-making values and principles of the Bible, they're seeing the salvation of thousands of the most difficult to reach. And here's what's interesting. The greatest impact seems to be in the Muslim world. More than they imagined ever possible. And it's fascinating that we, as 21st century Christians, are privileged to see the fruit of this harvest. It's born on the unbelievable centuries of brave men and women who have plowed and planted and sacrificed and done the work. And now the harvest is starting to come in. They have not been in vain. And the plentiful harvest is there. 
So it's important, they say, that they want us to understand that how they train their new Christians, the first and foremost, is we, we teach them to pray. We, we want them to know this is how you pray. But even in doing that, they said, as the process goes through, it's not by seminars and lectures and training, but simply they say, you know what? We're just going to have you do it. We're going to have you come and we're going to actually pray. And this is vital enforcement for a person coming out of that background where daily prayer is ritual. It's a rigid requirement. It's done by reciting memorized words. And for those, it's always a joyous revelation to discover that prayer in Christ is a conversion um, between a child and his father. It's a sense of, I have now a connection. It's a conversation. It's something deeper. There was a young man, Jacob, was committed to Christian um, life and being a missionary in Africa. God had called him to serve, and it was a heavily Muslim area. He moved his young family to a distant town. It had all kinds of dense forests around, and he had ambitions. He said, Lord, man, we're going to see great things happen here. And in this coming days, despite um, what the required resources were for him, his solution as he looked out, he said, I don't know how to, to do this battle, Lord. I don't know what you want. He moved to prayer. And he prayed along with his wife and several supporters who lived in the distant town. And they fasted and they waited and they prayed and they just lived out their lives in front of the people they were with, waiting for opportunities, taking, making the most of any opportunities to show Christ's love to them. And he says this, Jesus was Lord, but before he started his ministry, he went to the wilderness to fast and pray. He knew the power and place of prayer for the expansion and transformation of the kingdom. There is no way that you are going to succeed in ministry if you don't believe in the power of prayer, if you don't practice what prayer is. There's no great movement of God that has ever occurred that does not begin with an extraordinary prayer of God's people. The time is now for us to come together. Um, this is the time for us to say, Lord, we are inviting you into this, this place. We want to we draw in close to you. Um, it's, it's, some people have said we are on the cusp of another great awakening and that um, the revival is just already happening. We just haven't yet caught up because we're too blind as an American people. A little bit hard to read some of this. Um, but as we begin to see that God is at work beyond our existence, I think that's huge. I, I went to a conference uh, a number of years ago called The Shape of Things to Come. And, and I really appreciated the person who was leading the seminar because he talked very passionately. He said, I want to let you know the church as you know it. And this is, by the way, this is back in 2003. I went to this conference. I want you to know the church as you know it. It's going to be gone. And we're all like, what's he saying? What do you mean it's going to be gone? He says, I'm serious. You are going to go as Americans the same way that Europe went, the same way that Australia went. He was from Australia. He says the organization of the church, the kind of the structure that you depend upon, will go away. But I want you to know what's going to displace it is a highly active Organism that is alive and thriving, and people are going to be passionate about the relationship with Jesus and with, you know, walking alongside one another. It's going to change for the better. But for some of you who need the form and the shape of what church is, this is going to be tough. And I want to tell you what you're going to see in the coming days. And ironically, a lot of what he, a lot of what he said has come to fruition. But I thought it was interesting. You really kind of hammered that in the morning to say, do you realize it's going to change? Now, I want to help you to know what it's going to mean for you to be one of the change agents. But some of you who rely on just the structure and the peace, this is going to be difficult. You, you're, you're going to have a hard time when it comes to transition. But this afternoon, I'm going to walk you through what that's going to mean. So we come to the afternoon session. I'm thinking, here we go. Teach you away. We're ready to roll. And I'm looking around, and half of the group is gone. And, and I'm going, what, what happened? Where did everyone go? Did I miss something? Or is, it, is there another seminar? You know, what's going on? And the speaker gets up and he said, I want you to know, a lot of what I said this morning was hard for people to hear. And a vast majority of people 
pastors, the Christian leaders we talk to, he said, I'll be honest, every place I go, they, they're not ready for that change. They're just not ready. But for you, I want to prepare you for what that will look like in the future. And then he walked us through what that would mean to have this, this sense of passion, which they're finding all over the world, living in that simplicity of faith that lives in that place. Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, And in the movements of the Spirit, the first thing that happens, and which eventually leads to great revival, is that one person or a group of people suddenly begin to feel this burden, and they feel the burden so much that they're led to do something about it. So this morning, as the worship team comes back up, and uh, we're going to sing, and we're going to just... We're going to sing out our song of how we need God, and then we're going to do something that is going to be really important this morning, and that's I'm going to invite you to gather around with just a few people in your group there, and uh, just pull your chairs together, and in your insert, I've got a little bit of time for you to pray, and I'll walk us through that for the next 10 minutes of what that's going to look like after we're done singing, and I'd like you to stay and, and pray together, and then we'll all close up together, because we want to put into practice these very things that are making the difference all around. We want to be we want to be connected to Jesus. And when we do that together, I could be up here speaking, but it's so much better for us to just come and to just be united in prayer this way. So let us sing our need for him. And then I'm going to invite you to just turn how many different people. If you only want a couple people in the group, great. If you want a larger group, great. But we'll invite you to do that as soon as we're done singing this song called what? Why don't we stand as we sing here?
just go ahead and round your, you know, chairs up anywhere you want. Pull some people together there. I'll walk you through this a little bit. You can grab your insert. If you don't have one, there's a couple others back here that you can grab. And, uh, and we're just going to spend the next uh, 10, 12 minutes in prayer. And then I'll close up the very end. We're going to walk through this simple prayer time, which is uh, just using the acronym PRAISE, which is PRAISE, REPENT, ASK, and also look, look up your own needs. start with really praising our Lord, and I'm going to invite us to say this one all together. It's the first phrase on there for who he is, give thanks, and for specific things he's done. I'm just going to open up, we'll say it all together, this praise uh, part here from the message out of Psalm 63, and then you just go ahead in your groups, whatever God has brought to your mind to be thankful, go ahead and do that, and then after a few moments, I will, um, after a few couple minutes, I will close up with the, the final for that phrase. What are those things you're thankful to God for today? Let's, uh, let's praise him with this first one. God, you're my God, and I can't get enough of you. I worked up such hunger and thirst for God, traveling across dry and green deserts. So here I am, in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength and glory. In your generous love, I am really living at last. My lips brim praises like thoughts. I bless you every time I take a breath. My arms wave like banners of praise to you. Go ahead and speak your, your thanks to our Lord.
Lord Jesus, we have come to praise you, to thank you. We are people that gather with hearts and minds, one, and want you to be with them most of all. May you hear the deep our heart, and the joy it is of being your child, knowing you forever love by you, knowing you're even right now preparing a place for us, knowing right now you're working with hearts. Thank you for being present with us. Thank you for never leaving us. Thank you for always walking with us. I'd like us to uh, take a moment for some corporate repentance to start with. Um, you can see it also in your, and you can feel free to read along with me as I read this as part of our uh, corporate. And then I'm going to give you just a couple minutes. And again, if God calls you um, to say something to the rest of the group, but if there's something in your heart that God raises very specifically that you need to repent, just put it in his hands. Um, leave it there. And uh, that's what he's looking for. He longs to give his forgiveness. So uh, we'll do this first part and then give you just a couple minutes for silence or if there's something that God is calling you to show through. So, Lord, hear the prayer that we, your sons and daughters, now pray together. We confess the sins that we have committed against you. We recognize that we have done things that we should not do, but do anyway. And we have things in our lives that we should do, but don't. We have behaved corruptly by having independent spirits and have not looked to you to unify us. We've sought comfort and convenience instead of following nudges from your spirit. We have not stood for the marginalized and poor in our community. There have been times when we have participated in impure acts and not followed your way of purity. We have been unjust with our brothers and sisters, our neighbors, and with those we do not agree with. We have not kept the commandments that you've given to us. And Lord, we've sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved with all of our heart and soul. We have not loved with all of our mind and strength. We have not even loved our neighbors and ourselves. So Lord, forgive us for following the patterns of this world and falling into a materialistic mindset. We have chosen the immediate for the eternal way too often. So today, we humble ourselves. We pray and seek you. Your word promises that if we, who are called by your name, will humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, then we will hear from heaven and you will forgive our sins and will heal our land. Forgive us, God, for the times we missed the mark. Help us to live our lives filled by the power of your spirit within us. We ask that you would be with us, extending your grace, granting your freedom, providing your protection, and empowering us with your strength. We pray that you would bring about an awakening of your presence in us as we've never seen before. May your name be proclaimed in all the earth, and may every evil plan of the enemy be torn down. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. God prompting your heart to release anything into his hands, you might receive forgiveness and help in your time of need. Allow him to examine you and release that.
Lord Jesus, you've heard us, your people, confess to you. And you said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When you examine our hearts, it breaks us. But you, you break us so that you can fill us. I know that. You've done it to me many, many times. I ask that the overwhelming peace that past understanding will come upon those who have released those things you pointed out. May they feel the beauty of your forgiveness flowing through them. And Lord, may we offer forgiveness to all in our life as people who have been forgiven most. I ask you to now pray for others, ask God's help um, for them on their behalf. I don't have anything here. I've given a couple things to pray for. And so feel free to just walk through the different areas that you can pray for. And I'll give you a few minutes to do that. But um, who is God leading you to lift up at this time? Who is he placed upon your heart? Take some time to do that right now in your groups to pray for those that God is bringing into your mind and for those that are sure.
Lord Jesus, there's a lot more we could say in this area. The first come pouring out, I have to interrupt my thoughts just now to let you know that pour upon our hearts today that we might not forget. Um, just draw people to mind, draw situations to mind that when they happen, we can immediately go to you, put them in your hands. Because when we surrender to you and that burden, we pour our hearts to you. You listen, you hear, and you respond. And so we do that today. And so, Lord, we ask that you will take all of these and fulfill them <clears throat> according to your will as we rely upon you. This last section, I just invite you, if there are any needs that you have, um, and I just invite you to ask God to meet those needs. Oftentimes, you will share with the person, hey, will you pray about this? This is your chance to just pray, and those in the group will join you in that prayer. So if there's been a burden on your heart that you just would like, it's, it's not selfish. It's part of our, our own journey together. So go ahead and, and lift those up, asking God to, to meet your needs for what, you, um, what he's placed on you at this time. Thirty more seconds, guys. Yeah. Close out the first.
So Lord Jesus, we your people have come before you. You have said something extraordinary happens where two or three are gathered together and you're here in the midst. You listen, you hear, and you will respond. We now wait upon you as we pour out our hearts to you in these prayers. May these, the call of your love to us to unite with you in this way, in this conversation. Um, Lord, we just, I, I can't thank you enough. May we continue in this attitude to, to pray always and never give up. And so, Lord, we dedicate this time. We dedicate ourselves to you um, as we, your people, seek you. And all God's people said, amen. So I've given you a pattern. Uh, this probably, uh, if, you, if you haven't done this in a while, this could be uh, unbelievably distracting, right? This is hard to do. But I want to invite you. I've given you kind of a little prayer guide here. You can take this anywhere. Keep it with you, with your family, whoever. Just say, hey, do you mind if we pray together about some things? And you, I'll, I have extra copies. But, but it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to really begin to just have that as a common practice together. And I want to invite you to do that uh, on a regular basis. So I leave you with that. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Go in God's strength today. Oh.